Hello. Now we're going to talk about the second part of cardiac arrest or advanced life support. So there are three major cardiac arrest rhythms that we need to be aware of. Ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia, pulseless electrical activity, and asystole. And we're going to talk in some detail about each of those three, identifying some of the key similarities and differences between them. Let's start off with V-fib and VTAC. So these rhythms both represent disorganized electrical conduction, which originates in the ventricles. There's a number of different causes for ventricular fibrillation and tachycardia, but they're most strongly associated with primary heart disease, in particular coronary ischemia, so myocardial infarctions, et cetera. However, you can also see V-fib and VTAC in the setting of structural heart disease, inherited channelopathies, and other clinical situations. Least commonly, you see V-fib and VTAC with systemic metabolic derangements, things like electrolyte disturbances, autoimmunity, toxic ingestions, but that's really quite rare. The vast majority of these are caused by heart attacks. So here's just a review on ventricular fibrillation. Like we said in the last lecture, this is one of our two shockable rhythms. So this is randomly fluctuating, completely disorganized electrical activity, no pattern, no QRS complexes. The heart is literally just going blah, 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 in the chest. It's not actually beating, meaning that there's no cardiac output whatsoever associated with this because the heart's not contracting. This rhythm, if it's not terminated, is completely incompatible with life. By contrast, here's VTAC. So we mentioned this in a prior lecture as well, but VTAC is organized. It's just bizarre. So these QRS complexes are big and tall and wide, but they are organized and they are regular. Now, you want to think about VTAC anytime you see tachycardia, meaning a heart rate of greater than 100, most commonly greater than 150. That means your QRS complexes are going to be coming along more than every three millimeters on your tracing or more than every two millimeters in the case of a heart rate of 150. In this case, again, the QRS is wide, so it's got to actually be wider than three millimeters to be considered VTAC, but usually it's pretty obvious. These are big, wide, very strange looking complexes. And patients in VTAC can be completely pulseless, apneic, and dead. They can be completely stable and in some cases asymptomatic, or they can be anywhere in between. So the important thing with VTAC is when we talk about it in the context of cardiac arrest, we're talking specifically about pulseless VTAC, meaning we don't want to treat VTAC in a patient with a pulse, especially a stable patient, the same way as we would in a pulseless patient. Clearly, a stable conscious patient is going to hate if we start CPR on them. All right, so single most important intervention for V-fib and VTAC. We alluded to this before, but I want to emphasize again, it is to defibrillate. Now, the great thing about defibrillation is this is such an important intervention. We've started putting defibrillators in public places all over the world. So you can now find defibrillators in shopping malls, at sports stadiums, in the back seats of police cars, all kinds of places around the world where first responders can access them easily and use them quickly to save lives when needed. So we're going to go through the V-fib and VTAC algorithm now in some detail. So first and foremost, when you have a cardiac arrest, you're going to want to get help right away, and you're going to want to initiate CPR, the highest quality CPR you can possibly manage. Next priority is to get your hands on a defibrillator as quickly as you can and to administer a shock for V-fib or VTAC. We don't shock other rhythms, but for these rhythms, electricity is key. Your next maneuver is going to be to continue CPR for five cycles or two minutes before you perform another rhythm check. At that point, if you're still in a shockable rhythm, you're going to administer yet another shock. And this is also when you're going to give a vasopressor drug like epinephrine. After that, we're going to continue CPR for another five cycles or two minutes, where once again, we check the rhythm. We defibrillate if we're still in a shockable rhythm. And now we're going to think about use of antiarrhythmic drugs, in particular amiodarone. <music>